generation, we're talking about dead in trespasses and sins and then made alive spiritually, which is called being born again, being made anew, all of that language, stony heart out, living heart in, heart of flesh, so that you can understand the things of God. We argue that God must raise you from the dead before you can have faith. He says you have faith and then God regenerates you, which in so many ways just seems to be a completely illogical premise. I don't know how in the world you can argue that a dead person, it's like saying, okay, there's a guy who's had a heart attack, he's laying dead in the street. We're there with the ambulance, we've got the paddles. We're warming up the paddles, we're getting ready. Okay, we're going to zap the guy? No, first he has to ask. You got to ask me to zap you. Ask me to zap you. I'll zap you if you ask. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, zap me. Clear. <laughs> you know? But he can't do it. Why can't he do it? He's dead. You have to zap him first. Then you can talk to him about what happened. Well, that's the biblical notion, that we're spiritually dead. God must first regenerate us. He doesn't like that idea, because if that's true, then God doesn't regenerate everybody. And if God doesn't regenerate everybody, then it's up to God who gets regenerated, which means it's up to God who has faith and then up to God who gets saved. And he just doesn't like that idea. So instead, he wants to make sure that it's people's fault that they don't get saved and say that you have to, of your faith, even in your deadness, you have to decide to have faith in God and then he'll regenerate you and give you the new birth and make you alive. Spiritually dead people making the best spiritually good decision. Spiritually dead people making the best spiritual decision of their life. I think I'll choose eternal life, though I'm spiritually dead, and have no comprehension of God. And all that stuff we just read on Sunday, there's none that seeketh God, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. But I want you to do the best thing you can, which is choose life and live forever. I'll try to rush here. We are regenerated by believing in Christ. Did you get that? The Bible states... These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's John 20, 31. We are regenerated by believing in Christ, but Calvinism insists upon regeneration before one believes. You know, these are distinctions that Calvinists simply don't make. I don't say you get regenerated, then you walk around for a few weeks, and then suddenly, you know, you, you get some faith, and then you walk around for a few more weeks. And then maybe a year later, you read your Bible. and then no, it, These are inseparable things. These are the work of God in a person, putting his Holy Spirit in you, regenerating you, bringing you up from your spiritual deadness to life, which does produce faith in you. It's an, an all-for-one package. You can't separate it and say, okay, there's regeneration, but the man doesn't know anything about it. He's been regenerated. The Spirit of God's in him, but apparently doesn't have enough power to actually change anything. And then later, faith develops somehow, but we don't make those kind of distinctions. We say that all of it, this is what modernism is all about, that the regeneration, the faith, the born-again experience, all of that is God's work in you. We say it's all part of God doing this for his people. But clearly, the first thing he has to do is wake you up, right? First thing he has to do is make you aware that he's there. You're an enemy. What have we been reading? You're an enemy of God. You're blinded to God. No man seeks God. No man does any good. Well, then God has to be the first mover because you cannot move toward him. But we're wrong, it turns out, according to Hunt. So forget all that. Calvinism insists upon regeneration before one believes. A regeneration that gives life without believing the gospel. Well, no, 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 no. We believe that regeneration causes you to believe the gospel. You will believe the gospel if God regenerates you. Are we regenerated twice? Without believing the gospel, there is no new birth, no life in Christ. So Calvinism's regeneration as a prerequisite for receiving the gift of faith from God in order to believe the gospel is unquestionably heresy. Well, the way he wrote it, maybe. But that's not what we believe. It's not what we teach. And you can't find a Calvinist anywhere who does believe or teach that. You can't find a Calvinistic book anywhere that describes it the way he just described it. It doesn't exist. Ah, but we are dead in trespasses and sins, quotes the Calvinist to justify his doctrine. Yet even A.W. Pink rejected equating spiritual death with physical death. He says that and then doesn't bother to give us a quote to tell us where Pink said any such thing. But anyway, if the spiritually dead cannot hear, understand, and believe the gospel, 
If the spiritually dead cannot hear, understand, and believe the gospel, this is what we're requiring spiritually dead people to do, and if they can't do all that, then the entire Bible becomes nonsense. God's countless appeals to mankind to repent and come to him are a mockery. If those to whom he speaks are dead and cannot hear, if they are totally depraved and cannot repent and turn to him without the grace he withholds while blaming them for not repenting, the dozens of verses in which God commands all mankind to seek him and in which he promises that all that seek him with all their hearts will find him, these all become a mockery if the unsaved cannot seek God and if he only extends that grace to seek him to the elect. God pleads endlessly through his prophets, not only to Israel to repent, but he also declares, look unto me and be saved all ye ends of the earth. Yet no one can respond to these pleas unless he regenerates them first, which he refuses to do for multitudes with whom he continues to plead and rebukes and punishes them for not doing what they cannot do? You see, the whole point of Romans 9 is that Paul drives you to the question, how can he yet find fault for who has resisted his will? Right? There's no point to that question if that isn't what Paul's teaching. Paul is teaching, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and whom, I, whom he will, he hardens. It's exactly what he's teaching. He's using Pharaoh as an example of somebody that God raised up, hardened his heart, and then destroyed so that God would be glorified in the earth. And you will say to me then, how can he yet find fault? It's exactly what Hunt is arguing against. He's saying, that's not fair. It's not fair for God to tell people to repent and then not give them the ability to repent. Is Pharaoh responsible for his hard heart against God and God's people? Yep. Sure. Was there any chance that he could open his own heart? No. Did God actively harden his heart? Yes, according to the Bible. Did God judge him and hold him responsible? Yes, drowned him and his whole army, held him very responsible. Is that fair? Paul says, you'll say to me, how is that fair? And he goes back to, who are you to reply against God? Doesn't the potter have the power over the same lump of clay to make one vessel to honor and another to dishonor? He ends up going back there again, back to God's sovereignty. He goes back to, I know it doesn't sound fair, but you're talking about God here. And you can't, from a human view, tell God what you think is fair or not. And that is the exact thing that Hunt is wrestling with here. He just can't bring himself to cope with or deal with a God who can tell mankind to repent and then not give them the ability to do it. Calvinism makes a mockery of God's word. It has Joshua crying to those who can't choose, choose you this day whom you will serve. Well, that's the entirely wrong context. Joshua was not talking about salvation. And Joshua said that within Israel, who just had been redeemed out of Egypt. But we don't have time for all that. We don't have time for things like context. So you'll counter, but all are commanded to keep the Ten Commandments, though none can. So then what's the difference? Well, God does not cause a select group to keep the law and then leave the rest in their sin. All sin and all are condemned and all need salvation. According to Calvinism, God could save everyone if he so desired. But he chooses to save only some, i.e., Whoever is saved and whoever is lost is because God willed it, not because they chose. So you believe in a God who delivers.